There we go. That looks better. It is good to be here with you tonight to uh, open God's Word and proclaim it to you, but also to uh, talk with you a bit toward the end of the sermon as a part of it about the work of home missions in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Our text for tonight is in Luke chapter 24, the very end of the Gospel of Luke. I'll begin reading at verse 36 and read through to the completion of the chapter. Hear God's word. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because, their, because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed by him in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them, and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. What time is it? Not on the clock. You, know, you can look and see what time it is there, but think about the, the bigger picture. Where are we in the history of God's acts of redemption? We know that we're not back there in the garden. Sin hasn't just happened and, and God has clothed Adam and Eve. We're past that, long past that. And we know that we're not living in that time of the glorious kingdom of King Solomon with all of its splendor, with all of the blessings that God brought upon, upon his people through the reign of that king. But we also know we're not at the other end of the spectrum. We're not in glory. You know, we're not yet in that place where we see God face to face and get to enjoy his presence and sing his praises with the whole host of his people from throughout the ages. But we also know that we, have, that we are on this side, this sort of backside of the death and resurrection of our Savior the focus in this passage that I read, the, the, the verses that I'm going to be focusing on are beginning there in verse 46, where Jesus says to his disciples, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. See, where are we? We're past the death of Jesus, we're past his resurrection, we're past his ascension, but we're in that second half of what Jesus said there. He uses that little conjunction and, tying several things together. Now, he makes it clear there are certain things that are written, and they're necessary because they're written. 
It was necessary for Jesus to die. The scriptures had predicted that, had spoken of it. It was necessary not just because it was written, it was necessary because that was God's plan. That was his decree. It was through the suffering and death of his son and his resurrection that God would save a people for himself. But just as necessary, just as much a part of God's decree as the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus is the second half of that statement that Jesus makes and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. See, we're in this time now when we are to be going about, you know, this work. It's written, it was decreed, God has declared it, that now that the Savior has come, now that the Savior has done his work on the cross, now that the Savior is ruling and reigning at the right hand, having endowed his church with the power of the Holy Spirit, now we are in this age of gospel witness. We're in this time when we are to be taking to the nations, taking to the pagans. That might be another way of thinking of the nations. Because in the mind of the Jew, that's what the nations were. They were those people who didn't know God, who didn't worship God, but who worshiped all kinds of false things, images, and ideas. And so we, in this day and in this age, need to recognize that where we are is in this age of gospel witness. And that it's an age, not just of gospel witness, but an age of gospel harvest. That's what we see as Luke takes up you know, his account in the Acts of the Apostles. He begins the Acts by referring again to this question of time. What time is it? He introduces us in verse 6 to the question you know, that the disciples asked Jesus. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Where are we? What is God doing now? Where are we in his history of redemption? Is this the time when Israel will see the kingdom restored to it? And Jesus tells them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons and the epochs, but he goes on then in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. See, Jesus brings them back again to that truth. What time is it? Well, we can talk about different periods of time in all kinds of ways. But Jesus says the one thing to remember is that this is the time, once the Holy Spirit has come upon you, this is the time for you to be telling the nations about me. So that's where we are. Nothing has changed to... to divert us into some, other cha into some other period of time, into some other epoch. We are in this time of gospel witness and gospel harvest. And I think it's Luke's intent in the beginning of Acts, especially in all throughout Acts, to help us to see that this time of gospel witness is indeed a time of gospel harvest. That it's not just like the, the ministry that God gave to Isaiah, that we're to be ever prophesying, ever speaking, but nobody listens. Nobody's going to hear really what we're saying. Nobody's heart is going to be changed. People are not going to seek after God. It's not that, that uh, fulfilling of a ministry like that that we have been called to. It's a witnessing to Jesus with the full expectation that now that the Spirit has been poured out in power, People will hear, and they will repent, and they will have their sins forgiven in Jesus' name. And that's what Luke goes on to show us. 
He shows us beginning in Jerusalem there in chapter 2, in verse 41, you know, how there is a response to the proclamation of Jesus. Acts 2, 41. And so then, those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And then he goes on in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And you can go on in chapter 4 and chapter 6, you see how as Jesus is proclaimed by the apostles, people respond. They respond in faith. And even then, outside of Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee, in the, in the region of Samaria, that, that region where you know, there was a real ambivalent feeling about you know, these people in Samaria. But even there, they're responding to the proclamation of Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, Stephen is martyred. He's put to death because of his witness to Christ. And the church is scattered. Everyone except the apostles. And as they go, many of them went to Samaria. And in Samaria, they speak of Jesus. We read in verse 4, Therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word preaching the word. And we read about Philip going down to the city of Samaria and he's proclaiming Christ to them. And they hear him gladly and willingly and they respond in faith to the preaching of the Lord Jesus. And we read you know, later on in verse 35, And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, now we're in another setting. We're in the place where he's joined the Ethiopian court official. He's sitting in the chariot. The court official's been reading the prophecy of Isaiah. And he wonders, you know, who's the prophet writing about? Is he writing about himself? Is he writing about someone else? Well, Philip comes to explain it to him under the direction of the Spirit and we're told that Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture in Isaiah, he preached Jesus to him. And what happens? That court official says, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Here's some water. He's ready to be identified with the Lord Jesus. The preaching of Jesus results in people responding in faith. And we see that among the pagans as well. We get to Acts chapter 10. Sort of an impasse has come, it seems. Uh, the church has been rightly busy. The apostles have been rightly occupied. There's all sorts of work to do in this new, growing, mushrooming church of Jesus Christ. And they've been in Jerusalem and Judea and they've been in Samaria but they haven't been looking at the nations as yet. And what we see happening in chapter 10 is how God begins to move on, on both sides there, the side of the apostles, but also on the side of the Gentiles themselves. There are these obstructions in the way that keep them from inquiring more openly. We read in chapter 10 of Cornelius, this righteous Gentile, you know, who has sought after the God of Israel. You know, he's been gracious to God's people. He gives gifts to them. He gives them alms to the needy and the poor. And he's been praying. You know, he's practicing something of Judaism, those appointed times of prayer. You know, he's praying to God. He's worshiping God to the extent that he's able. But there are barriers, barriers for him you know, Jews have been raised with this whole idea that Jews and Gentiles don't associate together. And there are real barriers in the way. He can't just walk down the street to the local synagogue to learn more about this God whom he's come to know something of here in Judea. And he's praying. 
And then he has that vision, you remember. The vision of an angel you know, who comes to him and says, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. And your alms have been remembered before God. Here's what you need to do. You need to send for Peter. Here's his address. You know, have him come and listen to everything he tells you. Well, if that's the answer, you know, if Peter and Peter coming and telling Cornelius certain things is the answer, what's Cornelius' prayer? Well, the text doesn't tell us straight out, but we ought to be able to figure it out. If the answer is Peter telling him about Jesus, preaching of the fullness of this knowledge of God to him in Christ, you know, Cornelius' prayer must have been, Lord, I need to know you better. I know that there's still so much I don't know about you, and I want to know you better. And so God gives him an opportunity to do that. But at the same time, you know, Peter has this vision here in chapter 10, doesn't he? That great canvas that's let down out of heaven that has all of those animals in it that Jews weren't supposed to eat, those non-kosher foods. And the voice from heaven says to Peter, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's horrified. Lord, I've never eaten those things. And then there's a second time and a third time that the vision comes to him. And then the voice from heaven says, Peter, there are men knocking at the door looking for you. Don't ask any questions. Don't raise any objections. Just go with them. But the voice has also said, you know, do not call unclean those things that I have called clean. You know, Peter has to struggle with what that means. There's some things going on in his own heart that have to be wrestled with. It wasn't just a matter of being too busy to get to the Gentiles and to tell them about Jesus. There are some real trepidations in the heart of these Jewish apostles. When Peter gets there to the house of Cornelius, what does Cornelius do? Well, it starts out really badly, doesn't it? Peter's worst fears come to reality in some sense. Cornelius falls down at Peter's feet and worships him as if he's like Mercury. You know, the messenger of the gods, but a god himself. Well, to worship a man, to worship someone other than the true and the living God is abhorrent. It's abhorrent to us. It's abhorrent to Peter. He had grown up learning that there is that only one true and, true and living God, and he alone was to be worshipped. But he's grown up learning something else. You know, we hear it here in, in Acts 10 in verse 28. He said, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. He said, you know that, Cornelius. Peter knew that. And he felt it in his heart and in his gut. God has said, go to the house of this Gentile. Don't argue. Don't ask questions. Go. And Peter has gone, but it's tearing him up inside. This goes against everything that he's been taught all of his life. Jews don't associate with foreigners, and they don't visit in their homes. And now here he is. See, God needed to move on both sides to bring the Gentiles and the apostles of Christ together to bring the proclamation of Jesus to these pagans, beginning with Cornelius. But when he does, 
And Peter asks that question, why have you sent for me? And Cornelius says, he tells him the vision. And so he says, well, here we are. I've gathered all these acquaintances, all these friends. We're here to listen to you, to hear all the things that God commanded you. You know, look at that reminder that Cornelius brings. Peter, God commanded you to tell us something to tell us that there is repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name, even for us pagans. And that's what Peter begins to do. He preaches Christ to Cornelius and his household, and the Spirit falls upon them. Jesus is preached, and people respond in faith. This is the age of gospel witness, leading to a gospel harvest. Certainly not everyone who hears about Jesus responds in faith, but we ought to expect that many will. That should be our expectation as we go out, as Jesus has sent us out, fulfilling what God decreed we were to do, to tell the pagans, to tell those people that we would rather not be around, people who are sometimes scary, people who are sometimes frightening, to tell them about Jesus, that there is repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name, and only in his name. There's no other name given under heaven, given among men, by which we must be saved. And we need to tell people that. It's scary enough for us as Christians when the pagans come and sit in the chairs. It's not always easy to have them come and sit in the chairs because they come as pagans. They don't know any better. And they say all kind of crazy things, scary things. You'll never forget the really attractive young woman who came and sat in the second row with her two little children. And she did that for a couple weeks. And she seemed to scoot out in a big hurry. And then one Sunday, she lingered long enough for several of the women to introduce themselves to her. And it got scary in a big hurry. She said, first of all, well, God sent me. Well, oh, as Presbyterians, we're a little worried about that. Uh, you know, that Pentecostal sounding stuff is a little weird. Uh, well, what, it got worse. Because the next thing she said is, well, God sent me to get an answer to my problem. I'm married and I have a husband and I have a lover. And I don't know which I ought to choose. But God told me to come and get an answer. Well, what a place to get an answer. The church. A church where the Bible is believed and taught. You know, God sent her to the right place. And we began to minister to her. And as we told her about Jesus. And that there was forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. She embraced him in faith. And she made the right choice. She embraced Jesus and she embraced her husband. And within a few years, it was she and her husband and five children sitting in that row. Because Jesus was lifted up. Jesus said, I will draw all people to myself when I am lifted up. Well, he was lifted up on the cross, but we lift him up before the world when we tell people about him doesn't always happen in church. There was one point in time in the congregation that I served in Connecticut where we had a whole bunch of men who were gay sitting in the pews. Some of them believers, some of them not believers, some seeking to be celibate, some not seeking to be celibate. That was pretty scary for the congregation. And yet, God was doing a work because these, some of whom were pagans, were seeking after him in some way because of their friends who were telling them about Jesus. 
And as Jesus was lifted up before them, both in the preaching and in personal conversations, many of them came to faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel is powerful. It's not an exercise of simply throwing words into the wind, expecting that they're going to be blown away. But it's an exercise of seed sowing, isn't it? Remember that parable of the sower. Yes, some fall on the path and get trampled. Yes, some fall you know, and get snatched away by the birds. Some grow up in places where they get choked out by the, the weeds and thorns. But there's that fertile soil. And some of the seeds fall there. And there's a rich harvest, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. Well, that's the hope with which we sow the seeds of the gospel, of God's word. We broadcast it widely. We can't tell whether the soil is rich or not, whether there's a rocky shelf under it that's not going to allow the seed to really develop roots, whether thorns will come and grow up and choke it out. We don't know all of that. That's not in our hands. But we've been called by Jesus. It, was, it is written, he said, not only that he would suffer and rise again on the third day, but that repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name would be proclaimed to the Gentiles. And as we do that in obedience to what God has called us to do, the harvest is his. He draws people to himself through the ministry of his word. That should be your expectation. That's the expectation that we try to to encourage the church planters of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church to go out with as they go and connect with sometimes a small group of people, sometimes a larger group of people, and begin to seek to establish a solid Presbyterian, confessional, gospel-believing church. And as they sow the seed, it bears harvest. We have a number of bold evangelists that God has given to us. But they're bold not because they have some innate gift, but because they have confidence in the gospel. Confidence that when Jesus is proclaimed, people will be drawn by God to trust in him. You know, Jeremiah Montgomery is certainly one of those guys. He's in State College, Pennsylvania. And if you don't, didn't pick up one of the newsletters, they're on the table I'd hope you would pick one up as you, uh, as you head out tonight. But here's, you can't see Jeremiah, but he's over there. You know, Jeremiah preaches every week in the open air on the campus of Penn State University. And he doesn't do it without fear and trembling. He does it with a great deal of fear and trembling. And he not only preaches and disappears, but he wants to engage people in conversations about Jesus, and so he hangs around. And right there in public, he tries to engage people about their faith and what it is they're believing in that he might tell them about Jesus, the only one who saves. And there are people who start out mocking. There's one young man in particular who started out really heckling and mocking, but hung around again and again, and kept asking questions, and then was willing to sit down and talk to Jeremiah one-on-one, -on -one, and ultimately has come to put his faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we're seeing in our mission works around the country, you know, people who are hungry. We tell our church planters that you're really looking at three groups of people when you take the gospel into the world. You know, you're wanting to minister to those who are spiritually dead. You want to tell them about Jesus who gives them life. But you also want to reach the underfed. There's a lot of people out there in churches where the word isn't being preached. It's not at the heart of the life of that congregation. And they're starving to death. You need to minister the word to them and offer them the opportunity to come to be a part of a church where they're going to feast on the word and not starve. And the misled, those 
who are believing some aberrant theology or some aberrant idea. There are a whole host of homegrown uh, spiritualities in our nation. You see them here in California, but you see them everywhere. Everywhere. People make up their own theology and make up their own gods. They're misled. We need to tell them about Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. And that's what our mission works are, are all about. It's all about gathering people, the spiritually dead who are then redeemed, the underfed, the misled, to bring them together as a worshiping body, worshiping the Lord Jesus, worshiping our Father in heaven. That's what's taking place in all kinds of places here in the United States and Canada. Let me just tell you about a few of them. You know, if you, when you get your map, you can look down in Georgia and you'll see a little dot up in the northeast corner. That's in the area of uh, Hartwell. And Mike Myers is there. You know, Mike is a young man, just recently graduated from seminary, but with a lot of gospel background. You know, he went to the Boardwalk Chapel in Wildwood, New Jersey for two summers. He learned a lot there about how to talk to people, all kinds of people in all kinds of situations. And he's brought that to this rural area of Georgia. You know, the group that gathered, you know, gathered around a business. You know, one man established a canola uh, pressing and refining uh, business there. And he began to gather his, his family, his extended family, as the business grew. Other people uh, in the area as well. And this is a family that had a deep uh, solid reformed roots for generations and as they come to this rural area of northeast Georgia there's no reformed church anywhere and some of them are driving in one direction an hour an hour and a half and some of them are driving in another direction an hour and finally they said look there's enough of us we could start a church here and some of them were driving to OP churches and and began to talk with our regional home missionary, Lacey Andrews. And so they began to gather there in, in uh, Royston, now in Hartwell, uh, to be a church. And Mike has come to be their organizing pastor. And this is an area where certainly Christianity is not unknown, but it's a pretty mystical Christianity. Uh, lots of Pentecostalism, lots of mysticism mixed in with it. And they're seeking to show people the scriptures and what the scriptures say, so that people are basing what they, they're calling people to base what they believe and do on the Bible and not on all of these weird kind of things that they've been taught. You know, here in, in California, down the coast uh, by LA, uh, Chris Hartshorn has been meeting with people for a Bible study. He grew up in Anaheim Hills in that area and uh, was saved there as a young man in his early 20s through the Calvary Chapel and became one of their church planters. They sent him to New York City and God used him to plant a church in New York City. And then they sent him to Kansas, I forget the name of the town, and, and God used him to plant a church there. But you know, Calvary Chapel is big on preaching through the Bible. So Chris, with only sort of minimal uh, Bible training, has been preaching through the Bible. And as he's preaching through the Bible, guess what? He discovers the Reformed faith. It's biblical after all, isn't it? It's what the Bible teaches, the sovereignty of God, you know, the salvation, God's sovereignty in our salvation, God's decrees, and, and he wants to be better prepared to be a pastor. And so he goes to Westminster Seminary, California, and he's living there. He comes under the oversight of uh, Harvest Church in San Marcos and Pastor Mark Schroeder, but he makes regular visits back up to Anaheim to see his family, to see old friends. And as he's doing that, they begin to say to him, Chris, we know you've, something's been happening with you. Uh, your theology's changing. Won't you teach us the Bible? You always taught the Bible so well. Teach us the Bible. And so we, the Bible study begins, and the session of Harvest Church is, is overseeing it. And... and the work grows. You know, there's 40, 45 of them now on a regular basis. They worshiped for the first time as a mission work 
you know, just three Sundays ago. And uh, the Presbytery of Southern California is in the process of calling Chris, who graduates from seminary this May, to be the evangelist, you know, to plant the church there. But Jesus has been lifted up. It's not just Christian people that Chris has been gathering, but it's been all sorts of people uh, that have been coming and hearing of Jesus and are embracing him in faith. And across the country on Long Island, uh, Ben Miller. Um, I've lost the picture. There is, and there's Ben and Sarah Miller there. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, church plant. It was a daughter congregation. They started with everything that you could imagine, or almost everything. Uh, Franklin Square Orthodox Presbyterian Church, where Bill Shishko is the pastor, you know, sent them off. Uh, 75 of their people. Uh, ben was their associate pastor. They were grooming him to succeed Pastor Shishko when Pastor Shishko retired. Two of their ruling elders, three of their deacons, a bunch of their Sunday school teachers, all of whom lived up on the north shore of Long Island, and, and they sent them off to plant Trinity Church there and in, in now meeting in Huntington. And they've they become witnesses for Jesus in that area. They, they're learning how to be neighbors. You, know, you don't do big advertising campaigns in big areas like that. It's just way too expensive. It's got to be one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what they began to think about and to pray about and to begin to simply get to know their neighbors and to be able to talk about Jesus to their neighbors and almost every Sunday, you know, there are unbelieving New Yorkers, you know, pagans, we might say, sitting in the chairs in that Elks Lodge where they meet, hearing the gospel. Some of them have come to faith. Those original 75 people are now 110, 120 on most Sundays. And we praise God for that, but it's because Jesus is being lifted up. Because ordinary people, you know, the preacher can't do it all, whether in an established church or in a mission work, it has to be you. It's not just evangelists and preachers who are supposed to be telling people about Jesus. Remember when the church is scattered with the stoning of Stephen, the apostles stay in Jerusalem, everybody else goes. And so it's the guy in the pew who's going to Samaria, who's telling people in Samaria about Jesus. And the Samaritans are believing. It's not just Philip, you know, the deacon evangelist who's going. It's the people like you. God uses people like you. Audrey was probably like a lot of you. Audrey grew up in a Christian home, was considered herself a Christian all of her life had known a lot of hardship, but was faithful to the Lord. And she's in her 70s now. She's living in a senior retirement community. And to be quite honest, Audrey could be a bit rough. She had some sharp edges. She could be really impatient with younger Christians who were undisciplined in her way of thinking, who just didn't do what God was calling them to do. And they got themselves into all kinds of messes because they were undisciplined. They weren't reading the word every day. They weren't praying every day. They weren't coming to prayer meeting and Sunday night church. And so Audrey could have an edge, you know, a wonderful Christian woman, but had a bit of an edge. She was a master gardener. And she taught gardening courses uh, through the Agricultural Extension Service in our area. And Carol took one of those courses to outward appearances, you know, this was a woman who had it all. Beautiful home in the suburbs, a husband who had a high-powered executive job in New York City, uh, well-dressed, respected in the community, involved in a lot of civic things. But on the inside, you know, Carol was a mess. Her family was a train wreck. And she was looking for some peace. Well, in her mind, you know, the only place to find peace is you've got to get back to nature. 
And the closest she could think of to get back to nature was gardening. I'll learn how to garden and I'll feel a lot better. Well, in God's providence, you know, Audrey was her instructor. She and several others in the class. And then they were out in the community, out in various community gardens and parks, tending the, the shrubs and plants there. And so Audrey's doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one with each of the other five people in the class, including Carol. And it's not long when Carol begins to tell Audrey what's going on. She needed somebody to talk to. And here's this stranger, but a stranger willing to listen because she loved Jesus. And so she listens as Carol tells her about the son in jail for a really horrible crime and the daughter who's pregnant and the guy's taken off and the other daughter who's an addict who's stolen the family car who's stolen all of her mother's jewels worth anything who's taken anything that's loose in the house and is now living on the street doing what a young woman would do on the street to support a drug habit and Audrey is overwhelmed in one sense. She doesn't know what the answers are in one way, but in another way she knows what the answer is. And little by little, she begins to tell Carol about Jesus. Because the first thing that Carol needs is not an answer to all of her kids, but an answer to her own guilt. She needs to know that there's repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. And so Audrey comes to prayer meeting and week after week, she says, I didn't get to say much, but I told Carol a little bit about Jesus. And, and we'd pray for Audrey that she would know what to say next. And we'd pray for Carol that she would hear. And finally, Audrey asks her to come to church. And she comes, and she comes back, and a third time, and a fourth time. And God always has surprises for us. Because there have been some men not connected to the same church going to the jail where Carol's son is. And they've been telling the men there about Jesus. And Peter has had ears to hear. The Spirit has opened his heart and drawn him. And so when he gets to make that weekly phone call home, one week he says to his mom, Mom, I've got to tell you about Jesus. And Carol can say, I want to tell you about Jesus too because I've been going to church. This family's never gone to church. These are modern American pagans. And together... They begin to come to trust Jesus. And others in the family begin to trust Jesus. Even the daughter living on the street. Because Carol began to ask the church to pray. She wasn't so proud now that she couldn't ask for help Pray for my daughter. Well, how do you want us to pray? What do you want for her? Well, most of all, I want her to be safe. And so we prayed for her to be safe. We weren't sure what that meant. What does it mean for an addict living on the street, selling her body to be safe? But God knew. Three days later, the phone rings. Mom, I'm in jail. Well, that's a safer place than the street. <laughs> and she's in one place where we know where she is. And so mom gets to go and begin to tell her about Jesus. And a woman in the church with a past not much different from that goes along and begins to tell her about Jesus. And pretty soon she too is repenting and receiving forgiveness in Jesus' name. See, the gospel 
is bigger than our sin. But we need to tell people about Jesus. If you don't open your mouth and tell people about Jesus, there may be those who are all around you who won't hear about him because you might be the only Christian they ever rub shoulders with. They might not even know now that you're a Christian, but God wants you in their life that you might tell them about Jesus. And so I would urge you, you know, it's not for specially gifted people. It's people who often feel very weak and faltering, but who are willing to say a little bit. You don't have to do a 30-minute gospel presentation. Most people won't sit still that long. But you begin to tell them appropriate things in relationship to what they're saying and living through about Jesus. And God's Spirit begins to work. And you invite them to church. Here's where they hear the word, but on top of that, you have a whole host of brothers and sisters who get to show them the love of Christ. And for many, you know, that's just as powerful as the preaching of the word itself, to see it lived out in people's lives. And so I would encourage you to hear this call of Jesus. It's written, not just that I would suffer and die and be raised again the third day, but it's also written, it's also decreed by God that repentance and forgiveness of sins in my name would be preached to the pagans of the world. Let's pray.